Okay, so first we need, so we've got something that we don't really recognize here. It's not undoing the chain rule. So what would the numerator have to be if it was undoing the chain rule? What would the numerator have to be to have undoing the chain rule? He said 8x to the fifth. He said something, to the, something x to the fifth. Yeah, we absolutely have to. If you want to change the numerator to make this work for undoing the chain rule, you'd have x to the fifth. x to the fifth. And if you were to change the denominator, what would it need to be in the denominator if you change the denominator to make it undoing the chain rule? One plus x cubed. You want x cubed? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Neither of which we have. Okay. So we got to do something else. Um, so what does this kind of look like? One plus x to the sixth. Almost kind of looks like what? Yeah. So our tangent, but with our tangent we have. 1 plus something squared. So what is squared here? What, was, what, did, what would that be? So 1 plus what squared? X cubed squared. X cubed squared. Do you see that? So if we did a u substitution, but u equal x cubed, then we, our u integral might look like our tangent. This would be 1 plus u squared. Do you see that? Let's do that. So we're going to do u equals x cubed. Okay, and then du would be 3x squared dx. And so rather than solving out for dx and plugging u into this, I noticed that here, look at what look what I have here. X squared dx. And what do I have here? X squared dx. So what does x squared dx equal? D u over, over three. So I can substitute. I can substitute for this expression, and solve myself a lot of hassle here, rearranging things. Do you see that? Yeah. So there's x squared dx. There's x squared dx. So what does x squared dx equal? D u over three. So my integral becomes. 8 over 1 plus u squared, or uh, let's see here. We know x to the sixth is x cubed squared. So that's why this is 1 plus u squared. And then x squared dx is my du over 3. Remember when we have a when you have a definite integral like this, you've got two choices. You can change the limits so that there are u values, and then just finish the problem, or you can do the antiderivative and change your limits back back to back to these. Or, or sorry, you can do the yeah, take the antiderivative, change everything back into x, and use your x limits. So I think in this case it's much easier just let's change the limits into u values and be done with x. And so as x goes to negative infinity, what does u do? If u equals x cubed, it also goes to negative infinity, right? And as x goes to positive infinity, what does u do? Positive infinity. So, those, so, uh, so now we can be done with x. We can just solve this. And sure enough, we've got 1 plus u squared, which is our arc tangent. So we get... 8 thirds, tangent inverse of u, and we want the limit as a goes to infinity from be the opposite of a to a. Are we good so far? Do we have a question? Okay, so basically we have the limit as a goes to infinity of 8 thirds tangent inverse of a minus 8 thirds tangent
tangent inverse of minus a. Okay, so as a gets very, very large, what does tangent inverse do? So we have to know something about the tangent, tangent, tangent inverse function. We have to know, and actually I'm showing it here, that red graph is tangent inverse. And so as your input gets very, very, very large, does this approach a finite value? Does it go back to zero? Does it just get infinitely large? Do we know what that does? No, just tangent inverse. So tangent inverse, that gets closer and closer, and closer to pi over 2. All right, what about as a tan as x goes gets very very large negative tangent inverse approaches negative pi over 2. Yeah. Why are you using the pi over 2 again? It's no understanding that the what ta tangent inverse does. So tangent looks like this. And these asym these vertical asymptotes are at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So now arctangent, we only look at that much of the domain of tangent to get arctangent. We just take it from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So when you take arctangent, then input becomes output, output becomes input. So now your output of arctangent gets closer and closer to pi over 2 at, uh, as x gets very large. And as x gets very small, you get closer and closer to negative pi over 2. So you have to, you have to know the arctangent function or remember it. So then I think we get uh, 4 pi over 3 plus another 4 pi over 3. So we get 8 pi over 3. So now, here was our original integral. Oh no, I'm sorry. Here was our original integral. And we got this number. So what does that number mean? Sentence. Think about this is the exam problem. So, could you write a sentence that interprets the meaning of that number? Eight pi over three is what? Everyone, give it a shot. Eight pi over three is what? Everyone, write a sentence. Practice for the exam problem. So that, because we th we saw that that would be uh, one plus then u squared. Because we anticipate, we're anticipating our tangent. Be the
Gina, do you want to share what you wrote? Okay, that's, that's true. The rate of change gets small enough so that we get a finite value. What is the, that finite value? What does that finite value mean? Brock? Uh, I'm still writing that. Still writing? Yeah. Uh, I have the total amount of change from negative infinity to infinity of something with the rate of change as 8x squared over 1. Okay, so he so said, over, over a cheaper. Well, is that it? Is that it? He says, the total amount of change as x goes from negative infinity to infinity of something that has a rate of 8x squared over 1 plus x to the 6. Yeah, well said. That's good. We call that our stuff. Total or global rate of change? Or the. Not a rate. I mean, the, the quantity of change. Like unbounded or total or global. Because it's from everything to everything. Yeah, right, so you can't, okay. Um, there are no bounds. Yeah, I don't think there's a special name when you have mega infinity to infinity. It's just if you start, if you start accumulating or start putting your quantity as far as the eye, as far as you can go, and then, yeah. From? All the way from mega infinity to infinity. So, well, let's graph this rate function. What is the rate function? Eight is it eight x squared? Cool. All right, so so then the amount the, this quantity we're starting way out here negative infinity that quantity. It increases, then it decreases back to zero. Then the quantity increases again, and then it decreases, right? The amount of that quantity. Agree with that? So that the quantity itself, the amount that we're calculating, first increases, then decreases, then increases, then decreases. Disagree. Disagree. What's that? This is the rate of growth. So then what can you say about the quantity as we start from negative infinity and x increases to infinity? What about as it reaches as it more reaches C as it get, as it gets less negative, it, it reaches zero. Sorry, what are you asking? I'm asking about the quantity. Here's the rate of change. I'm asking about the quantity. As x goes from negative infinity to infinity, how does this quantity accumulate? It doubles. It doubles. It continuously increases. Continuously increases. Why does it continuously increase? Because the rate of change is always positive. The rate of change is always positive. Now, along the way, does the quantity go back to zero? No, the, the amount of increase does what? You just add zero. Positives, right? So it's, it's, so it's going up. It's always going up. And then just for a moment at zero, it pauses. And then it keeps going up again. So it's going up, and then it pauses, and then it's going to keep going up and up and up, and then that total amount of change is 8, 5, or 3. It's the total amount of change that we get from negative infinity to infinity. Is it convergent? Yeah. Got a finite value. And why is it convergent? Let's see what happens here. It's quick enough, right? Quick enough. Going to zero is just not enough. It's not enough to set that the rate goes to zero. It also must get to zero quick enough for it to converge. And this apparently does on both sides, right? On both sides, it's very small. And then we get some, some significant growth in our quantity in the middle. And then after so much, then just very, very neg negligible growth so that it's a finite amount of growth. Okay, other questions on this? Okay, uh, how about from the written? Is there, 
One or two from the written? Forty. So, uh, let's see here. So let's pull it up here. You had four from this sheet, right? Okay. So it was uh, 35, 36, 39, and 40. So I heard 40. Other suggestions? 36. Other nominations? Are these the two we should do? Okay, let's vote on 36 or 39, okay? So I'm, I'm thinking 40, we want to do 40, is that right? All right, all in favor of 36. All in favor of 39. The rest of you don't care. All in favor of 40. And all in favor of 35. Just kidding, okay. I mean, all right, so let's do, uh, what, did I, what did we say? I don't even, I don't remember now. All in favor, of, so let's, between 36 and 39. 36 and 40. 36 and 40. Okay. We don't plug infinity. We never plug infinity in. Okay. No, you can keep it. Okay. So 36. So first we want to get, so for 36, we're going to have limit A goes to infinity. Or we could do limit as A goes to negative infinity. That's fine. And then we're going to have antiderivative of this will be basically square root of 8 minus x. And we're going to need a, a negative 2. And then we're going to go from a to negative 3. Good on the antiderivative? OK with that? All right. And so then we're going to have limit as a goes to negative infinity of negative 2 times square root of 11 plus 2 times square root of 8 minus a. And now a is going to get really, really big negative. So what will 8 minus a do? Just 8 minus a will... No. No, a is going to get really, really big negative. So 8 minus a will be positive infinity. And then the square root of a minus a will be... If the square... If, if, yeah. Divergent. And if we look at this, this kind of relates, kind of indirectly relates to our p property, right? Because this is essentially like 1 over x to the what? This is essentially like 1 over x to what power? Half, Half right? So yeah, there's a negative, and yeah, it's 8 minus. But those things, when you are know, talking about x being very, very large values, uh, 8 doesn't really, you're just adding 8 to a trillion, then adding 8 to a trillion to the trillion. It's just kind of inconsequential. So essentially, for very large values of x, you have 1 over x to the 1 half. And here p is, what, less than 1, which we know is divergent. But we still have to show it mathematically, okay? So essentially, you're, you've got the case 1 over x to the 1 half, which we know is divergent. Why is it 
because you have this uh, by the chain rule. Uh, so you're undoing the chain rule, right? So this is 8 minus x to the negative 1 half. Okay, so then you'd have 8 minus x to the positive 1 half. You're going to need 2 for the 1 half. You're going to need a negative 1 for, for the negative x. Okay, other questions about 36? Okay, 40. So 40, the, you should see very quickly that this is going to be partial fractions. You've got x plus 4, x plus 3. And so we're going to have uh, a over x plus 4, b over x plus 3. So a plus b is 0. 3a plus 4b is 1. So that one there. So then uh, here I think b equals 1 and a equals negative 1. Because if I put in the opposite of b here, I get th negative 3b plus 4b is 1b equals 1. So a equals negative 1. So then I have 0 to infinity of... Well, did your, was your a over x plus 3? If you put your a over x plus 3, then yeah, your a is 1. So in the end, you should have your negative 1 over the x plus 4. Is that what you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so try. Okay, are we good? So we're going to have a limit as x goes to inf positive infinity of uh, natural log of x plus 3. We don't need absolute values because we're talking about positive values of x anyway. And then minus ln of x plus 4. And that's going to be, oh, sorry, A. And that's going to be from 0 to A. So this put uh, ln of Minus ln of 3 plus ln of 4. Okay, so what poses a slight problem here is that we end up with, so natural log is going to get infinitely large as A gets infinitely large. So we have infinity minus infinity, which is an independent term of form. That could be infinity, that could be a constant, that could be 0. Essentially, we're, we're looking at infinity minus infinity. No, it could be zero, it could be a constant, it could be infinity. Okay, this is it's called an indeterminate form. How do we resolve that? How do we resolve that? Well, we notice that we have the difference of natural logs. Oh, nice. And, oh, and if, do you remember what, what that equals? Natural log of? A plus 3 over A plus 4. So this is a this is one of the the laws of logs that the log of a quotient is the difference of the logs, and so therefore the log of the difference of logs is the log of the quotient. So now we can make heads or tails of this. It's no longer an indeterminate form. This ratio, as a gets very very large, will become what? This ratio, as a becomes very very large. But we know what this is. It's going to be 1 because it's going to be basically a over a, right? As a, as a gets very large, these three, this 3 and this 4, inconsequential, right? So that, no, this is just um, back in pre-calculus, you learned irrational fun, uh, limits and behavior of rational functions. And if you have the same degree in the numerator and denominator, you basically have the ratio of the coefficients. Okay. So you mean that for the test of that one, you forget about the infinity? What's that? Do you, do you forget about the infinity of one test when you 
kappa than the A plus uh, field or A plus field. So we're comparing the degrees. Well, we're comparing the degrees because they're both exposed at the same rate. So we think of you know a trillion plus three over a trillion plus four. And then a zillion plus three over a zillion plus four. And then a gooba gooba billion plus three over a gooba billion plus four. A Google plus three over a Google plus four. You know what Google is? Yeah. What is it? It's the number of pages. Ten to a hundred is a Google. Right? So a Google plus three over a Google plus four. What is this becoming? So we have a Google uh, over a Google. Yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Which goes to? One. one. And as that ratio goes to one, natural log goes to? Yeah. Zero. And so we get LNO4 minus LNO3. Or natural log of four thirds. Yeah, that's the Questions on this one? So, and then looking back at the original problem, essentially, what is this like? One over what? What is what? Essentially, our original rate function is one over what? Um, yeah, x squared, but even smaller than that, right? Because we're adding some, some more x's, right? But essentially, this is 1 over x squared, which converges or diverges? P is greater than 1. P is greater than 1. But this is helping even more, right? So adding 7x makes that even smaller faster. Yeah. But all you would need was 1 over x squared. So we can kind of look at this from the beginning and say, oh, we're expecting this to converge because it's essentially something smaller than 1 over x squared. We know 1 over x squared converges, and so there, that's confirmed that it converged. Okay. All right, so there's a, um, this, there's two types of improper integrals. This was type one. So type one improper integrals. No, you can keep it to study. I've been recording, yes, thank you. Ask me sooner. But yes. Improper integrals. Type 1, we'll just, we won't spend long on this, but type 1 is the ones we've been doing. Infinitely wide intervals. Infinite. Right? Either we're gonna we're gonna let let that thing change out to positive infinity, or we're gonna start our amount of change at negative infinity. So that's type one. That's the ones we've seen so far. So type two is a, a finite a finite width of interval. but has a discontinuity within it. Shouldn't we just subtract the discontinuity? Uh-uh. -uh. It's not. Oh. So we'll talk about it. Okay. It's, it's, uh, this, these don't boil down to a one-sentence answer. Okay. Okay, and so then that and that uh, that discontinuity this kind of is a uh, vertical asymptote. Okay, the vertical asymptote somewhere in the interval. So let's just look at some of these examples from. Here we go. So negative one to eight of one over so number thirty-two.
So where's the discontinuity here? So we got a finite width from negative 1 to 8. We're going to do our x goes from negative 1 to 8. But this is improper because somewhere in there we have a vertical asymptote with discontinuity inside there. Where's the discontinuity? x equals 0, right? So our rate is undefined at x equals 0. So we're going to use limits again. We're going to look at we're going to split this up into two integrals. We're going to look at the integral from negative 1 to 0 plus the integral from 0 to 8 but we can't plug 0 in 0 is undefined, so we need a limit. We need a limit as a approaches 0 for each of these, because 0 is on, um, the rate is undefined at x equals 0. Do we have to go from the left and right? Um, no. Uh -uh. Uh, uh, so, you know, so you only need you only need, like for this one, you only you only need the limit from the left, and then this one you only need the limit from the right. So if you, yeah, exactly. But you don't have to, you don't do them both from the left and the right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You consider one for each. So the limit as x approaches uh, a. Zero. A approaches zero. And this will be from the left. Because from within the interval towards zero. That's right. Okay. Negative one to A. And then plus the limit as A approaches zero from the right in this interval from 0 to 8, a to 8. Okay, and now, now we evaluate the integral and we evaluate our limits. And if we get a finite value, then we have a convergent type 2 improper integral. If we evaluate the limits and we get a divergent uh, limit, meaning an infinite amount, then we then it's a divergent type 2 improper integral. So antiderivative. This is one third, so this is negative one third, so add ones can be two thirds, right? Three halves. Someone said. Not negative, right? Because when you add 1, you get positive. Okay, and then we're going to go from negative 1 to A. Let's just do this first one. So it's going to be... Three halves times a to the two thirds uh, minus three halves negative one to the two thirds, and that's going to be the limit as a approaches zero. That's going to retain the negative. Right? Um. No, because that'll be a cube root would be negative, but squared would be positive. It doesn't matter what order you do. What? It doesn't matter whether you square or cube. Right, you square first, then it's positive, cube root is positive. Okay, cool. Okay? 
So then we get uh, 0 plus 3 halves. Uh, minus, thank you. Okay, and then the other one will be 3 halves x to the 2 thirds from what? A to 8. So I'm just doing them separately here. 3 halves, uh, I think that's time, that's 4. 8 to the 2 thirds is 4, is that right? And then minus 3 halves A to the 3 2 thirds. Which equals, uh, is that 6? This is cube root squared 4 divided by 2, 2, 6. So therefore, it's is 12 halves, so 9 halves. So what, from, from 0 to negative 1, we had an amount of decrease in the quantity of 3 halves, and then from 0 to 8, we had an increase of 6. So the overall change then would be the 6 minus the upper 9 halves. So let's look at the graph and see if we can confirm that. The rate change graph, 1 divided by x to the 1 third. So from, it's kind of hard to see, but so from negative 1, so we're going from negative 1 to 8. From negative 1 to 0, we see the rate of change is negative, so we had an amount of decrease of negative 3 halves of our quantity. And then from 0 to 8, our rate of change is always positive. So we have this amount of increase of 6. And so then the total change was this negative amount plus this positive amount that we get, or 9x. Are we only going to deal with these points, these continuities? What's that? Like I'm thinking, OK, so we could express a function in a really nasty way where there's a big gap. We could do the same thing, right? There's no way to give us these, like, points, these continuities. I'm not following your question. Like imagine we have our rate of change during this, and then it like skips a whole bunch, right? And goes over here. Yeah, if the rate of change is undefined, you can't you can't find an amount of change. So couldn't we just look at where it's defined along a certain larger interval? Yeah, but if you if you're truly saying that your interval includes that place where the rate is undefined, then you can't define the amount of change. You can't assume it's zero. No, you're okay. saying it's undefined. Zero is different than undefined. Okay, that's the yeah. If it is a rate of change of zero, then yes, the amount of change is zero through there. So we can say it's this but, plus that plus something we don't know. And then therefore the sum is something we don't know, right? It's undefined. Okay. Yeah, zero is different than undefined. Yeah. Zero is different than undefined. Okay. Other questions on this? So notice, so what about if this were, uh, I just want to show you something. Look at what, if this were at type 1, would this be conversion or divergent? If we had a type 1, with 1 over q root of x. Divergent. divergent. And you look at, look at how it's making its way to 0. How is it making its way to 0? Slowly. And we see that there's too much growth for that thing to level, for the growth to level off. Okay? But, so, but then notice when they're, you know, in infinity, it's getting to 0 very slowly. But then notice what's happening. Um, how is that thing getting to negative infinity at zero at the discontinuity? Very quickly, right? So when you have this, like that rule, that p rule, it's like flipped from the type one to the type two. See? And the type one, if p is less than one, it's divergent. But if p is less than one, then around the discontinuity, it gets there very quickly, and so then you get your, it's convergent. So it's getting to the asymptote very, very quickly. 
Okay, so it's conversions. So it's a, it's the opposite rule. We have we have p less than one, and we have a convergent type two angle. But you can see it in the graph, right? You can see how quickly it gets to the asymptote, where it's how slowly it's getting to zero. Are you going to tell us if it's a two on the right side? It's a no. Well, that's easy to stop. Right? I know. But it's just that this is how. No, it's be, so, so if we had 1 over x squared, then as a type 1, it would be convergent, but or let's do 1 over x cubed. Now notice, if we had a, a type 1 for 1 over x cubed, convergent or divergent? Convergent. Convergent, p is greater than 1, and you see it's getting to, it's getting to 0 very, very quickly. But then what's that? How is it getting to this asymptote? So it's taking its sweet time to get to the asymptote in terms of that. Um, so uh, my terminology is a little bit wrong here. So it's actually, it's very quickly approaching zero, but also very quickly approaching infinity. That it gets to infinity much faster before you get close to zero. So I, had, I was talking in reverse. So, um, and because of that, because it's because this is going to infinity much, much faster, we're gonna get a, we get a divergent type two angle. There's a lot of change about the y. Right, before you even, you even get very close to x at all, right? It's already, it's already um, going wildly down before we even get anywhere close to zero here. And that's why that would be divergent, right? So when p is greater than 1, a type 2 integral would be divergent. So it, the rule is flipped. That, that p rule is flipped for type 1 and type 2. Yeah? So, okay, extending what you said about the undefined region. Uh -huh. So at 0 in the original example, the rate of change is undefined. That's the right. The left and right hand limit still in the green. What's that? So the left and right hand limit still in the green, right? Because we're going like this. Of the rate function. Yeah, so it's undefined. So how can we say, like I, I agree, I want to say it's the, the accumulation from here uh -huh. plus that, but uh -huh. then in the middle there's some mystery, which I know is nothing. But it's only at a, at a particular value. One, so when it's one, one value, particular value, right? I assume there's no difference. Um, yeah, so, so the amount of change at any particular value is always zero, either if the rate is defined or it's undefined. Yeah. It's just a point, there's no change. Yeah. But as soon as you have an interval, if it's undefined, then you can't define the amount of change. I'm saying that's it. But you can hear at 0. 0.6, how much does it change? Nothing. No, it's nothing, because you don't have a change. That's cool. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the exam. The exam is multiple choice and free response. Um, the first 13 multiple choice questions have to do with all the stuff we did before we got into the techniques. So we spent like two or three days on meaning of integral and the fundamental theorem. The first 13 multiple choice are all about that and all about the, those homework. I'm going to give all your homework back to you today. So let's just write this out here. So uh, multiple choice, 1 through 13 is all about meaning of definite integral and the fundamental theorem of practice. So days one and two, and well, I'll go through the slides, the summary slides again, just still take us five minutes, so we can do that in a second. Um, so all that stuff is really important for the exam. Okay, and then there's uh, nine more or so uh, multiple choice. And free response. Um, techniques of integration. And improper integrals.
<coughs> and that's the exam. And there may be there may be some pre-response relative to meaning meaning of integrals, interpreting um, interpreting final values, interpreting expressions, and stuff like that. Okay, so um, let's just go through. So you're definitely going to want to study all your homework related to those first two or three days. So that we, um, but I will let's go over the, the just the PowerPoint slides that talk about the different principles of the fundamental theorem just to review that. So just quickly here, making sense of the fundamental theorem, it's calculating an amount or amount of change. And what was the first principle? Constant rate of change. First principle is constant rate of change. That a change in a quantity is the rate of change times the change in the independent quantity. Where does that show up in our fundamental theorem? Where does delta y equals k delta x, where is that? Involved or in, in that fundamental theorem expression. K delta x is the integral. It's the whole thing. No, more specific than that. Well, K delta x is f of x times dx. F of x times dx. What's the difference? So, what's the difference between when we write it as k delta x and we were to write it as f of x dx. What's the difference? It's, it's the same principle, but yeah, okay. Constants are changing rate of change. What's that? The constants are changing rate of change. Okay, that's one difference, right? So k is a constant rate of change, and f of x is a changing rate of change, and then there's another significant difference. dx is a different as small x. Yeah, so here we're, we're, we're moving from chunky changes in x, finite values, relatively large changes in x, to Atomically small, right? Distance between electrons is your dx. So this is for uh, relatively large changes in x. And then when they get really small, and we take kind of like every single rate, right? We think of every single rate as a really small constant rate. And then we have a very small change in x. Okay? Principle number two, changing rate of change. Lots of times, a uh, rate of change is a changing rate. And so we want, The first principle is using constant rate of change. But the second principle is that we're usually starting with a changing rate, but we want to use this k delta x principle, and so what do we have to do? We have to make a pretend rate function. Mimic the rate function with constant rates, so we know that we can apply principle one, and add up the changes. You did that in your homework, that's important. Okay, this, all, this stuff, all these little steps are important. So then the total change is the sum of a bunch of k delta x's, where these k's are pretending to be the changing rate function, right? k1, k2, k3, k4, step, like a step function that's trying to be like the changing rate function you were given. Okay, and then principle four, we're going to make more smaller inter intervals. So the, the smaller your intervals, the better that those constant rates do at mimicking the, the changing rate function. 
And here's a really small interval size. Those are all constant rates. And you can see that that, that changing rate function is taking form. Okay? And then if you want to get do the best you can do, make super small intervals, atomically small. And so then the sum of all the amounts of change based on constant rates becomes the integral. Okay, principle six. There's two ways to represent an amount of change. I'm using the integral that we just said, but then if you had just the quantity function itself, it would be the final value of the quantity minus the initial value of the quantity. And that's the right side, right? That's the right side of the fundamental theorem. So we can add up bits of change based on the rate, or we can just take the final value of the quantity minus the initial value of the quantity, and those will both give us the change. And so then that quantity function f is the antiderivative of the rate function to the left. That's principle seven. Okay, so all that is really important for the exam. So go back and not only understand this kind of the big picture, but then applying all these principles, right? We have homework questions that were about understanding all these different principles. That's all fair game for the test. What did you have last year?